you would turn with me in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Mm, 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 mm. Well, I feel God in this place tonight. I, I, I just do. I do. Mm. Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Let's stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. In verse number 11... The Bible says, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where, thou, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power... And, my might of, and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant with which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. You may be seated. And uh, for a few moments, I just want to preach the thought, remember and forget not. Remember and forget not. Uh, as we approach another Thanksgiving holiday, uh, I'm reminded the world wants to rush past this season and go straight to Christmas, and it's not because they want to celebrate the first advent of Christ. It's because of uh, the financial benefits. There's economic opportunity. But I think that uh, we need to take our time and talk about gratitude to God for uh, a few messages. Gratitude's not something little or insignificant to God. It's supposed to characterize His people. It's not something we should rush past. And if you're saved, can I tell you, God expects you to be a thankful people. He expects you to maintain a heart and a spirit of gratitude. You find that all throughout the Psalms. But though this should happen naturally because of sin, because of our sin nature, we are prone, we are in danger of becoming ungrateful. And that's why God's people are given a command to remember and forget not. You say, what does remembering and being grateful have to do with each other? Can I tell you, one is contingent upon the other. You see, when you consciously remember and review God's goodness in your life, as you review God's goodness, then gratitude flows up naturally from the wellspring of your soul. But when you forget God's goodness and forget to review it, ingratitude begins to settle in your soul like a pile of stones on the wellspring where gratitude should flow. That's why God says continually, remember, remember, forget not. Remember, forget not. Just here in this passage alone, in this chapter, in verse number 2, he says, And thou shalt remember. In verse 11, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Verse 14, Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God. Verse 18, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. And it shall be, verse 19, and it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God. As we see just illustrated in this passage alone, or emphasized in this passage alone, we have a problem. We are prone to forget the Lord our God. And so there's a principle that's established and emphasized throughout the Bible. It's really emphasized in the book of Deuteronomy. Over and over in this book, God through Moses tells the children of Israel to remember and forget not. Remember where you were when I found you. Remember who brought you out. 
Remember who sustains you. Remember who is a source of your blessing. You must never forget the Lord your God. This is how you get into trouble, by the way. That's how you wreck your life. You want a path to wrecking your life, young people? Forget the Lord your God. Say, when I get out of, ha- out of the house, I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to forget the God of mom and daddy. You want to wreck your life? There's your, there's your, there's your prescription for doing it. That's a path to ruin. That's how you get in the spiritual ditch. That's not just for young people. That's for everybody. But we find here there's a positive and a negative component to this principle. Positively stated, we are to remember. Negatively stated, we are never to forget. But it's the same principle. It's just stated two ways. One seems more encouraging. Remember, the other strikes up fear, the fear of forgetting. But both are necessary for the believer, and they lead to the same purpose. They lead to a life of holiness and a life of gratitude to God. And let me, let me jump into this message by discussing, first of all, the principle of remembering. And by the way, when people are on the altar, I know God's usually doing a work of reminding people of their sinfulness and where they could be apart from the grace of God. And that's a blessing as we become reminded and then begin to thank God for what he's done for us. But the principle of remembering, what did God mean when he told the children of Israel over and over and uh, 13 times in the book of Deuteronomy, he says to remember? What did he mean when he tells the children of Israel to remember? Uh, The context of this command is very important. As many of you know, the background is the Israelites, they had been uh, in slavery in Egypt. God brought them out supernaturally. He delivered them. He brought them into the wilderness. He led them for 40 years because of disobedience. They stayed in the wilderness for 40 years, but he kept them. He sustained them in the wilderness. And now they're on the brink of entering into Canaan. Canaan is the land that God promised. It's what's known as the promised land. This symbolized a life of blessing for God's people. The wilderness was a place of barrenness. The promised land, Canaan land, is just the opposite. It's the place where they no longer wander. It's the place of permanent dwellings. It's the place of uh, plenty to eat. It's, it's the place of dependable water sources. It's a place where there's land to be possessed and ultimately a home established and an inheritance to leave your children. It was a legacy. This was the place the people had been dreaming of since Egypt. Those that had survived, those that are now in this generation and uh, have been in the wilderness This is what they've been looking forward to. So as they're about to enter this land, God was extremely concerned about them remembering. Why? Because we are prone to forget. Listen, we are living in a generation that has forgotten. I mean, listen, that's where we have all this entitlement. I continually preach on that. We think we deserve everything, and we forget that the only reason we have is because so many have done something for us, and we are benefiting and being blessed by the work and the, uh, the sacrifice of others. And we've lost our gratitude. We've got children that have forgotten that the only reason they have those shoes on their feet and those clothes on their back and that roof on their heads because somebody got up and went to work and was thinking about them and is earning a paycheck to put food on their table. And, and the reason we have uh, so many opportunities and privileges is because somebody has done something for us, but we are so prone to forget. God knows we have that problem. And he's concerned about his people remembering and not forgetting how they got to Canaan. When they get to the land of plenty, he doesn't want them to forget about who is the source of their blessing. He knows we have a problem. We get so absorbed, if we're honest, we get so absorbed with the goodness of God and enjoying the goodness of God that we forget the God who's been good to us. We get so absorbed with enjoying the blessings of God that we forget the source of the blessing. In this book, and specifically in this, chap- specifically in this chapter, God calls his people to remember and not to ever forget. And right here, I need to explain and, or pause and explain what the Bible is speaking of when God calls his people to remember. There's different aspects. The first is the cognitive component. What does God mean when he says, I want you to remember? Well, Remembering, first of all, involves the brain. Some people are checked out right now, so I know this isn't possible for them. It's Sunday night, and not everybody's here. I understand that. Uh, 
But re remembering involves the brain or the mind recalling someone or something in the past, something you know, but it's not present in the front lobe. It's not present in what you would call your high consciousness. It's not actively present in your thoughts. It's, it's buried in your memories. And it's bringing that thing back to your high consciousness so that that thought is fresh again. That's the first aspect of biblical remembrance, but that's not all that God intends for his people to understand when he says remember. There's also a commemorative aspect or component of remembering. When you commemorate something, you both recall it to memory, but you also memorialize it in your heart and mind. You memorialize someone or something in the past. For example, on our communion table are inscribed the words that Jesus spoke at that memorial supper when he said, this do in remembrance of me. You know, taking the elements, the, the cup and the bread, and we're to partake of it ever since that moment where he established it, in remembrance of him. Now, Jesus was not simply saying, hey, guys, I just want you to remember the historical facts 2,000 years ago. That's it. I want you to have just a cerebral experience. I just want you to understand those things intellectually and comprehend them. No, he was saying, when you do this in remembrance of me, it's to be commemorative. You've got to be cognitive of what took place, but at the same time, you need to recount who I am and what I did for you 2,000 years ago, and that sacrifice should have an impact upon you now. It should be a memorial that affects you in the present. What happened 2,000 years ago should have an ongoing impact upon your life. It's to be commemorated. There's another aspect to biblical remembrance, and it's to be celebratory. Can I tell you, God don't bring up the past to make you feel guilty. God shows you the past to remind you why you should be grateful and thankful. Not only should we commemorate what God through Christ has done for his people, but we should also celebrate it. Paul said, speaking of that memorial supper, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. As we reflect on Christ's sacrifice, it impacts us. It has a, listen, if, if you are truly saved and you observe the Lord's Supper as you should, it has a purifying effect upon your life. Can I, can I get a witness? I don't want to continue seeing and partake of the Lord's Supper. I promise you that. I'm reminded that there was a great cause to set me free from sin. And so it impacts me as I think about that memorial supper, but at the same time, there's also the enjoyment and the joy that it produces within me because we celebrate his death until he comes. It's a reminder that Christ conquered sin, death, and the grave, and he is coming again for his people that he purchased with his own blood. It's kind of like even on Memorial Day, we both reflect the sacrifice of the past, but we don't just mourn. We celebrate the freedom we have today. You celebrate that you are enjoying today something that was afforded to you in the past. You're celebrating today what was accomplished in the past, in your yesterday. And that's the full principle of remembering that God intends when he calls his people to remember. There's to be an awareness of what happened in the past. We cannot forget that, but there's also to be, it's to be commemorative. It should have an impact on the present, but it should lead to rejoicing and enjoying what God has provided for us in the present. It should produce gratitude and celebration. Now, what exactly did God command his people to remember? Well, in this passage, beginning in verse number 2, he said, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. The second thing I want to draw to your attention are the particulars that God calls his people in this passage to remember. Now, now back in chapter number Six, the Lord reminds uh, fathers to teach and tell their children about the laws of God and remember to tell the, uh, their sons and their sons' sons the things they have seen God do and the experience that they've had in following God, lest those children forget. But in chapter number 8, he says, Before you enter Canaan, 
as you're leaving the wilderness and moving into this land of plenty, you need to remember your experience, first of all, in the wilderness over these past 40 years. Isn't that what he said, verse number 2? And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. First of all, remember the place of the wilderness. Remember how I led you in the wilderness. So we need to remember, first of all, the place of the wilderness. And you say, well, what is the wilderness? Well, let me describe it for the Israelites and we'll make the application. But in verse number 15, here's the wilderness. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water. Doesn't sound like a place you want a vacation. The place of the wilderness. Wildernesses are barren places in life. Places where nothing seems to go right or work out. Places where you don't know which way to turn because everything seems to have dried up. There's no water in the wilderness. It's a, it's a desperate place. The wilderness speaks of hard times, of difficult times, of troublesome times. It's a desperate place. The wilderness can be a dangerous place as well. In the wilderness is where you have fiery serpents and scorpions. Things, let me say, things that inflict pain. God says, in effect, remember, child of God, when you go into the land of plenty and promise, when it seems like things are going well for you, don't you dare forget how life was when it was extremely hard, when it was impossible to survive, when you didn't know how you were going to make it through the wilderness. Remember, don't forget that. Well, that's what we're quick to forget when times get a little better. When now there's leftover money in the bank account, when now the report comes back from the doctor and things are looking better, we tend to forget what it was like when we were in the wilderness. Anybody ever had a wilderness experience? You say, I'm not sure if I have, Brother Mark. Well, here's how you know. You're in the wilderness when you don't know how to get out of that place that you're in. When you don't know how you're going to make it in that place and you need a miracle to survive it. In fact, you feel like you're just moving in endless circles and cycles. This time in your life, this season has no meaning to it. You're not making any strides. And when you think you're doing okay, there's some scorpion there to sting you. I'm talking about things that just simply continue to inflict pain. And when you think things are looking good and, and beginning to be uh, our bloom in your life, you find out there's nothing but drought. Things don't bloom. Things don't grow in the wilderness. Things don't look hopeful. Things don't look up. Things appear lifeless in the wilderness. Anybody ever been there? If you haven't, keep living a little while. But not only the place, God says, remember the provision in the wilderness. Look back at verse number four. In those 40 years of wilderness wandering, listen to what the Bible says. He said, thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. There's a reason why your feet didn't swell and your shoes fit and they didn't wear out. That wasn't by chance. Verse 15, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness? You, you had someone guiding you in a place of uncertainty when you didn't know which way to turn. There was somebody who was leading you and guiding you. Who led you? Notice it. Led thee through that great and terrible wilderness. Who, who didn't leave you there? Who brought you through it? Who navigated you through that time that seemed like, this is going to take me out, God? Where were fiery serpents? And scorpions, and drought, where there was no water. Who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint? Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna? And God says, not only remember the place, this, this hard and difficult place, but also remember the provision in the wilderness. Remember who kept your clothes from wearing out. Remember who led you through the great and terrible wilderness. Remember who gave you water when there was no water to be found. Remember who fed you bread from heaven when there was no food in your pantry. Remember when you, you're in between jobs or you get laid off. You might not have had this situation or you're trying to start up a business and you don't know where it's coming from. 
But somehow, some way, as you followed God, he continually made a way. I don't know how we made it through with those in those times. There's times even when I stepped out by faith to start working with Chris, and I, I knew God was working in my heart because I was out of church too much with the job that I was working, and I knew God wanted me to, to do something more than just uh, what I was doing. And I didn't know he was preparing me to preach, but I knew God wanted me to step out. And I thought, well, I'm going to take a big pay cut, and I don't know where it's going to come from. Can I tell you something? God took care of me as I look back. He took care me every step of the way. It didn't make sense financially. It didn't always add up in the checkbook as we continued to tithe. I just know God took care of me. And led us through. Remember who brought you through the wilderness, he says. Remember who put food on your table when there was none in the freezer or the pantry. In other words, as you look over your 40 years, Israel, remember, you didn't make it through the wilderness on your own. Boy, look at us. Boy, we made it through, didn't we? Who led you through? It wasn't you who led yourself. You didn't know which way to turn. Who supplied you? Well, we we, we seem to just be so innovative. We we, we found things for ourselves. No, no, that, that bread fell from heaven. That water came from a rock. (laughs) It was not you who sustained you. It was God. And you would not be here on the brink of Canaan if God hadn't brought you through, if God hadn't supplied you, if God hadn't sustained you. Remember God. Don't forget him. I'm always amazed at how when things get a little better, but we go through hard times, going through relational difficulties, financial difficulties, health difficulties, all kinds of situations in our life. I'll tell you, we're on the altar. We're praying and, and seeking the face of God, and we're faithful to the church house, but let things begin to turn. It's a little easier to forget God, isn't it? And that's how we are by nature. We're prone, and God's warning in that season of better times. Don't forget. Remember where he brought you from. Think of the provi- remember the provisions. And remember why he allowed you to go through the wilderness experience. You say, why did he allow us to go through the wilderness experience? Look at verse number 2 again. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. To what? To humble thee and to prove thee. God allows us to go through some things to put us to the test. To know what is in thine heart. Now, this isn't for God's benefit. This is so we can see what he sees. To know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Notice the proving through the wilderness. God says he takes his children through the wilderness. This is Romans 8, 28. God's going to work through all things. God says he takes his children through the wilderness. He allows them to go through these barren periods, through difficulties, first of all, to humble us. It's awful easy uh, when you get saved. First of all, you're God's people. You've been forgiven to start thinking, boy, I'm really something, and start looking down on sinners. Or even after you're saved, think, well, you know, I'm saved, and God's taking care of the worst part. Now I can kind of do life on my own. I'm here to tell you, you can't. We need humbling, and that's why God allows us to go through wilderness experiences. You see, we like to think that we can make it without God. You say, no, we don't. Well, then why do we struggle with praying as we should? Prayer is the acknowledgement, Lord, that we need you for everything, even our daily bread. We like to think that we can make it without God. We live ignoring God. We live as if we are self-sufficient, as if we can take care of ourselves and do just fine without God. And then God sends us through a wilderness where we find out just how helpless we are. Let that heart skip a beat and you're laying in a hospital room. You'll find out how helpless and dependent upon God you are. In the wilderness, we discover just how desperately we need God. In the wilderness, we realize that we cannot make it apart from God. And if he does not intervene supernaturally, we're toast. These times are purposeful. They're not wasteful. They're purposeful because it is in the wilderness that 
in, in these barren periods of life, in the painful difficulties that we cannot escape, that God humbles us, but he also proves us, the Bible says. He puts us to the test. He says, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commands or no. Don't talk of faith when you're up on the mountain. Anybody can talk faith up there. When everything's going well, like I said, when there's, uh, when there's leftover money in the checking account at the end of the month, when there's plenty of food in the cupboard, when, when your health seems to be doing fine, when the kids are not acting a fool and seemingly acting normal, when, when family, family relationships are seeming, seemingly well, when there's no stress on the job, when you're not taking any heat politically or socially for your faith. Listen, it's easy to talk faith then. But walk in tomorrow morning and get laid off from the job. Go to the doctor and let them say, I see a dark spot on your x-ray. Let that spouse, who you placed all this faith in, walk out the door. I didn't say God calls that. I, listen, if you go through that, God will use that too. But talk of faith then when your child goes astray. Talk of faith when, when life's not going as it should. And, and I'm telling you, what, everything's just frustrating. Every which way you turn, there's frustration. There's war. There, there's, it seems like the people that at one time you, you could really count on, they become scorpions. They only inflict pain to your life. They betray your trust. People you have poured yourself into. You parents, you know what it is when you pour yourself into a child and they turn their back on you. I'll tell you, there's nothing that cuts deeper than that. It's easy to talk faith when everything's going well, but what about in the wilderness? That's where your faith is put to the test. The mountaintops don't prove faith. Canaan land's not exactly where you can really boast when everything's going well of faith. It's, it's in the wilderness. When there seems to be no way out. It's in the place that seems hopeless. That's where you find out what's truly in your heart. In the places of desperation and difficulty, that's where you find out what you truly believe. That's where you find out how much you really trust in God. It's easy to sing about it whenever everything's going well, but what about whenever everything's not going well? If you're truly trusting God... In those barren times, in those wilderness times, in those difficult times, you're going to keep following God. You're going to keep clinging to God, and your heart will be proven. It will be manifest. You'll find out that your faith is legitimate in the fire. Can I say I've sat beside many believers in the wilderness in their final days. They were in their wilderness. That Canaan land for them became heaven and they were wandering no they knew that it was looking pretty dire they're getting no good reports as i was preparing this message brother holden i was thinking of your dad those final days can be a wilderness for believers difficult hard no good news the only the only thing you got to cling to is the word of god that's the only thing you got in that moment. Nurses can't help you. Doctors can't help you. Listen, family can be there beside you, but you're in a wilderness, and it's a desperate situation, and it feels hopeless apart from God, but it's in the wilderness that you'll find out what's revealed in your heart. And I want to tell you, in behalf of your father, I'll tell you why his faith came shining through as he continued to praise God and give witness for Christ in those final hours. Watch those in difficult times as their faith held to God and trusted in his word. Though they did not see any good in the earthly situation, their heart was put to the test, their faith was put to the test, and their faith was proven. In verse 14, the Bible says, Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Notice the problem before the wilderness. Now he's speaking of Egypt. God says, don't just remember the hard times in your, 
your wilderness experiences, don't just remember the difficult times, but also remember where you were before the wilderness. Recall you had a much bigger problem than what you've experienced in the wilderness. You were in slavery and you would have died in slavery in that land of bondage had I not rescued you and brought you out of Egypt. Don't we tend to forget that we were slaves to sin and Satan when difficult times come? I mean, we get a, a temporary situation that is extremely hard and difficult. I'm not minimizing that, but it's an earthly situation. It's not an eternal situation. And we forget where God found us. And we would have died in our sins. And that was a much worse situation if we'd have died in the spiritual Egypt of this world in a sinful condition, a shackled by Satan and sin. That would have, that was a, that's a much difficult situation. So, listen, even in my wilderness experience, I need to remember, listen, I might be here right now and I might not be out of the wilderness because some of you might be there right now. But I do know this. God's brought me out of Egypt and I can rejoice in that. And the God that delivered me from my greatest problem is still the same God that's with me in this temporal problem. Can't lose sight of the bigger problem because God's already taken care of the bigger problem. And who spared not his own son but delivered him up for his own house? Shall he not with him freely give us all faith? If God brought me out of Egypt, listen, even when I'm in the wilderness, I can trust that he's going to bring me through the wilderness. When you forget that and you only focus on the present wilderness, the present situation, you lose sight of what God's already done. And it'll steal your gratitude for what you should be eternally thankful for. Now, these times are purposeful, and here's why. Look at verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee. He allowed thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not. That's really what the literal interpretation of manna is. We don't know what this is. They just knew it came from the sky. Which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know. Now watch this. That he might make thee know. This was intentional. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Here's the point to remembrance. Here's the point that God was teaching his people in the wilderness. God says the lesson of the wilderness is to teach you not to trust in, in your physical abilities or human resources. You're not trusting in the, the, just the, the physical provision of bread. Listen, you're trusting in God who is the supplier of all your need. You trust in his word. You learn to trust in his word. Trust in me by receiving my word and living by and believing that I will supply what your soul needs. And if I supply what your soul needs, I'll take care of your temporal need. God wants his people to know that he is enough. He brought them through those experiences to let them know, listen, they didn't have a prayer to hang on other than, God, we're going to trust you and follow you. And God said, that's enough. You, you, don't, you don't mark your life. You don't live your life chasing the temporal. Listen, you chase me. You pursue me. And you seek the eternal. And you'll find the temporal. You live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. The Lord thy God. God wants his people to know he's enough. We don't gauge how we're going to make it through life by what's in the checking account, by what's in the pantry, by how the stock market's doing. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in God. He's the source of our life. And we cannot make it without him. You can have all the bread you want piled up and stored up. Listen, if you don't have Christ, you're not going to make it. But if we will live according to his word, we will find that he gives not only spiritual life, but he supplies all we need for physical life. You see, he is our life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Can I say that if you have not learned this lesson, then you need to stay in the wilderness. How long do I need to stay in the wilderness till you learn this lesson? That we don't live by bread alone. Lord, just meet my, just meet my physical needs. Lord, just, just take care of this temporary situation. You do that, I'm good. No, listen, you haven't, you haven't graduated. You need to stay in the wilderness till you learn. We live by the word of God. And if I live by the word of God, God will take care of it all. And if you begin to drift from that, you need a wilderness. 
When you begin to think, well, man, I'm doing pretty good. Look how I'm saving up. I went from a jalopy to I got two cars. I'm in the best shape of my life. Whatever. Everything's working out. And now all of a sudden your dependence starts shifting from the word of God to me. Can't take, Watch out. The God who brought you out of the wilderness can send you right back. Canaan land might not be your continual experience. God can drive you out of the promised land. Here's the point to remember. We live by the word of God. Listen to these verses. In verse 7, for the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. Here's the danger of forgetting it's in this place. A land of brooks of water. Now we don't have to go worrying and crying out, where's water? Of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. Now we're not having to depend on God for bread to fall from the sky. A land of oil, olive and honey. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Now I can go to any restaurant I want. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron. And out of those hills thou mayest dig brass. In other words, there's wealth. And when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God. There's, listen, that's how you begin to protect yourself. When you begin to enjoy these things, at that moment, it, there ought to be a holy tremble in your soul. You go, hold up a second. This is, this is the provision of God. And if I'm not careful, this will steal my affection and my dependence. And I, I, I listen, at that moment, I begin to enjoy these things. I got to stop and say, I praise God for all that I have. I praise God for all that I enjoy. I praise God because, listen, I got to bless him in the good times and the bad times, in the, the times of scarcity and the times of abundance but in the abundance there's a, there's the opportunity for me to to lose my uh dependence upon the lord and stop praising him stop giving him thanks verse 11 beware that thou forget not the lord thy god in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which i command thee this day lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up. But look what all I got, what I'm doing. And thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter, latter end. And thou say in thine heart, as you look around in this land of plenty, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Can I tell you something? If, if those electric impulses in your brain don't start firing right or aren't firing right tomorrow morning you're not going to work if a little blood clot happens to be thrown and go into your brain and you stroke you're not going to work tomorrow if those lungs collapse and you don't take your next breath you're not going to work tomorrow we can boast and say, well, I do this and I do that. I'm going to tell you something. It is God who enables us to work. It is God who gives us our faculties to even think. Listen, it is God who sustains us. It is God that we are dependent upon. We can't afford to forget him. Verse 18, that thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day can i say in closing there is a protection with remembering listen carefully to what i'm going to say remembering and forgetting not it's because first of all it leads to gratitude and god is worthy of our praise and gratitude but it also protects you as a child of god it safeguards your life verses 19 and 20 and it shall be if thou do it all forget the lord thy god and walk after other gods. You say, we don't serve other gods. Can I tell you? We go after the God of recreation and pleasure more than we realize. And the God of materialism and every other kind of God you can imagine. Amen. Put those things first and begin to pursue those things. Give those things our affection. Here's a warning. 
walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. Those things will lead to your ruin. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish. You think God's going to turn his head to sin just because you're his child? Oh, no. He's going to deal with your sins just as much or more. So shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. As I said a few moments ago, God can send you to the wilderness just as surely as he brought you out of it. God will deal with his wayward people. He doesn't simply deal with the heathen sin. No, he deals with all sin, especially those he is in covenant with. Remember and forget not. Why? Because as you review the goodness of God and where he's brought you from and how he's sustained you and how he's kept you, how he's led you, how he's provided, it causes you to begin to bless the Lord and give thanks to the Lord. It helps you maintain a spirit of thanksgiving, and it's for your own good. It also reminds you not to forget the Lord who is the source of all that you have. The Lord can give and the Lord can take away. And the Lord will chasten his own. Let me leave you with these words. And as the pianist comes and they do that, so I want them to do that song again. Verse 1 says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live. Here's the blessing. Here's the protection. That ye may live. And multiply. And go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. God says, if you, won't let, if you won't go pursue another God, you'll keep me first. You worship me. You obey my word. It's going to be for your benefit. I'll take care of you. I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. This is the good path. That's what I want for you. Can I tell you, God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. And let me say, blessings aren't simply material. The greatest blessings are spiritual. You can't put a price on God saving your lost family. Can I get a witness on that? And verse 2, and thou shalt remember, remember, remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Don't forget those difficult times that God you were crying out to back then who's brought you through, brought you to this point. Don't forget him now. To humble thee and to prove thee. To know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. As he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. How'd that happen? God took care of them. Verse 5, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. The, the things that are frustrating your life at times is because God cares enough to keep you from going the wrong way or staying in that state of sinfulness or stubbornness. Verse 6, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Church, I think it's pretty clear. God says, Remember. Remember and forget not. Let's bow our heads.